He will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on this show, the X-Mang Stripe. Such a pleasure having you. Great to be here. Fantastic. And uh, it's been quite some time that we have been talking to each other. And every time we talk about having you on the podcast, our conversations go in all different directions. And it's always so much fun interacting with you, uh, knowing your life, the kind of work that you're involved in. It's like I've known you forever. We're two souls that somehow connected through the technology of today. I, I absolutely feel the same. Well, let's take a dive. You know, you are born in New York City. And uh, so how is it to be raised in a city like New York, right? How has it so, that shaped you as an individual? I suppose one takes their surroundings for granted. So I grew up here in New York City in one of the boroughs. Um, as an adult or a young adult, I wanted to live in the big city. I wanted to make a life for myself, make a career in Manhattan. And I did that. Um, and it's been decades of living a life um, here in New York City. And I think what, uh, how it shaped me most, and we'll, we can talk about what I do today and, and what I want to be doing in the future, is that because I worked in the hospitality tourism realm and welcomed over the course of my years at the Met, 150 million visitors and managed countless thousands of people and volunteers, the, uh, I don't know how to describe it other than the souls of the universe have kind of marched across me and I've absorbed a little bit of everyone. So for me growing up in New York was quite normal, yet quite magical because not many places on earth can you be in a role where you welcome the world and it's yeah. been a blessing. Oh, absolutely. I can resonate with you 100% because, you know, in fact, my memory of New York is the Central Park. And I remember I got an opportunity to interview one of my mentors, Gary Ranker. Uh, Forbes magazine mentioned Gary as one of the top five coaches in the world. And my interview with him at the Central Park was one of the turning moments of my life because, you know, watching Gary from the closest quarter, spending two days with him, learning from him, understanding his life was so magical for me. And the interesting part about New York, and, and as you were talking about, I could resonate with that because every second person was coming there from a different nationality, different country, different color, different creed, different caste. And yet all of us were melting into the same pond called New York. Incredible, isn't it? Just absolutely incredible. And to be paid to do it and do, never feel like, never feeling like it was work, just being thrown. And obviously the Met is in Central Park. Mm. I crossed the park for years to go to work. So Central Park is somewhat my backyard, if you will. Yeah, and yeah. a place where the world meets, and it's just—I know this isn't a commercial about tourism in New York, but it seems uh, like it, it seems like <laughs> advertisement, yeah, as if we are promoting New York together. <laughs> yeah, but it's been yeah. So tell me about your childhood days. Uh, well, the lessons so, that you learned from your parents that continue to shape you today. The, the, I would say the number one thing that I learned was um, you don't realize it when you're in the middle of something or I, you don't appreciate your childhood when you're in it. But now as an adult, you look back, both my parents are gone. But when I think about the, the, the life that I had and growing up not in Manhattan, off this island, I'd realized mm. the seeds for being kind, being courteous, being polite, just being a good person were, were really planted at the kitchen table, right? Like so many people, mm. if you've been blessed to be born into a family where it's safe and loving and fun, um, that shaped me. So as I yeah. went out to the world, um, my biggest, you know, fans, my dad always worked in the city, so it was, that was quite normal, but my biggest fan was probably my mom just super excited that, you know, her son gets to not only work in New York, but live in New York, meaning Manhattan. 
So it really yeah. shaped me. The, the last thing I would say, um, I've been doing much thinking, writing, and talking about this, is that my mom was the youngest of nine. My, my sister, brother, and I were the kids, right? So you have, imagine the youngest of nine with her own kids. Mm. Everyone was older than we were. And mm. everyone, it was every Sunday at grandma's house. And so I grew up in an environment of big, messy, complicated family. Mm. And my career turned into just that. I manifested large teams, crazy, good crazy, <laughs> um, chaos and enthusiasm for a crowd. So uh, I, I suppose if it weren't for those early years, having kind, nurturing parents yeah. and growing up as part of this huge family, I don't think I would have been prepared to be in the hospitality business. Thank you for sharing. Few aspects, in fact, when especially you talk about being a kind person, being a good person, I personally believe that being a good person, being a kind person will never go out of fashion. And, and it's needed more now than ever. Sorry to cut you off. Needed more. Yeah, time. absolutely. And there's dearth of goodness in the world. But at the same time, it's because of goodness that the world exists. That's one mm -hmm. part of it. The second part of it, when you said, when you spoke about your mother, well, and I think all mothers are the greatest cheerleaders one can have. Absolutely. You know, I remember my conversation with my mother. I was just preparing how to juggle. And we committed one of our clients that we are going to teach you how to juggle as a metaphor for leadership development. We made a commitment. I came back home. I said, shucks, man. We just made a commitment. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do that. From morning till evening, I was preparing and I was trying and I was trying and I was trying and I was failing terribly. Around five o'clock in the evening, my mom came to the second floor where I was practicing to my room. And she said, Gaurav, wherever you put your eyes on, you do that. And I trust you because I know you're going to do this as well. Well, you won't believe that. She turned around and I was juggling. I believe it. There's something magical in the blessings that you get from your mothers. And I personally believe that mothers are common. Mothers mm -hmm. are common. <laughs> That's so beautiful. thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. And and I can talk about mothers throughout the episode. Well, I personally believe that there are instances in our life that can change the trajectory of your life. And those moments, those episodes, they become the defining moments of your life. How about you? I've had, you know, I think about that and I talk about that um, a great deal. I've had multiple, right? You've got the personal revelations that you go through, you know, family, um, marriage, death, and then you have the professional. So mm. on the professional side, I start there. On the professional side, I came into the city wanting to have a career and wound up working in super interesting places, big, big complicated businesses with, with large teams. And I realized I was a leader the moment we had massive layoffs at the in 2008, 2009. Mm. And I realized I had to deliver the news to dozens of people that they were no longer going to be employed. Mm. And that's heart wrenching. It was um, heartbreaking. And I realized the dozens of people were more than dozens of people. They mm. were hundreds of people because it had an impact on their family and their friends, on their community. And so I'd realized when I was suffering through that, those who remained and those who we were saying goodbye to needed a human. They needed, they just didn't need a manager, a director, a, a department head delivering hard cold news because it was beyond anybody's control what had happened with the financial downturn. And so I'd realized, wow, I've been given this role and I became a leader because it's a privilege. It's, it's not work. I always loved the public. I loved my teams. I loved my colleagues. And then you, you, you take this shift. Oh, leadership isn't about you. You can bring something, 
and you bring your personality and your style. But what people need most is an authentic mm. leader who, who actually leads from their heart. And I'd realize, okay, I don't always get everything right. And I'm sure there's probably people would say I got many things not right. But if you let your heart and that empathy guide you, you, you can do great things. And that was a career changer for me. Mm. Total career changer. Mm. And where did you pick up that kindness is important? Where did you pick up empathy is important? <laughs> where did you pick up? How? I'm not laughing at the kindness question. I, I, I always, I was an introvert. I was always very much aware of being different. And I was mm. an observer. I was the guy who sat in the back of the class. I was the one in the room on the sidelines. I wanted to be invisible. And so when I was in a professional realm, having to speak in front of people, lead people, you mm. can't go into introvert, um, disappear, invisible mode. So you put on this persona. And the way I got to be able to do my job and, and perform was I needed to make other people comfortable. So I mm -hmm. suppose I started to make people feel comfortable with the things that would make me comfortable. Mm -hmm. Humor, chit chat, getting to know people. Where are you from? Uh, oh, what grade is your kid in school? Oh, those sorts of things. And mm -hmm. again, I took it from the kitchen table, my, my, my childhood, which was all about community, cousins, in-laws, neighbors, and it was a sense of people coming together and mm. getting to know one another. You know, this is so and fascinating. That... Yeah, I'm so sorry to cut you short, Will. No, no, no. But this is so fascinating that how the early days of our childhood, the early days of our development, uh, how that has a huge impact on who we become as an individual. Well, I did hear you saying that I knew I was an introvert. I knew I was an observer. I knew I was invisible. You also use the word, I knew I was different. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm, look, when I'm listening to introvert, observer, invisible, and then I knew I was different. Right. You know, in my body, I experienced some kind of separation. What does that mean when I, you're saying that I knew I was different? So um, growing up, I always knew I was different. Part of my coming into the big city was to find my life, right? Find my career, find my friends, find who, who I was intended to be. And along the way, in my early years, I met my now husband. So I'm, mm. I've been an openly gay man for many, many years. And... Um, it's something that I never spoke about. And this goes to about changing. I just was. I came in to do my work, to be a kind person, never really spoke about my identity. And then as the world started to change and catch up, it, I realized part of me being an introvert, part of me trying to be invisible is I did not wanna call any attention to myself. Just mm -hmm. wanted to keep my private life private because it was, I mean, it's uh, here in the States for sure. Um, it's, it's totally uh, evolved. And right now in the news, you can see it's sliding back a bit, but we won't get into politics. So I'd start to realize again, in my personal life, I was born this way. I was different and I've known it since I was a child. And so yeah. If I have a platform, if I'm able to speak to, to who I am and my identity and speak about my husband, I used to shy away from it. Now I feel it's important to talk about it because I just happen to be a professional, a kindness advocate, a leader who happens to be gay, if that makes any kind of sense to you. Mm. And it's not a sort of this is who I am, accept me or not. It just is part of my being. And it's as much as, you know, my hairstyle, right? There are certain cards we are dealt in life and certain ways that um, you, you are. And so my, my journey and my kindness advocacy 
is really, I think, comes from not only the lessons learned in childhood, but it really does come out of who I've been as a leader in my professional mm. life and who I am as a human, understanding differences mm. in, in people and cultures, and there's no one right way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Will. Because on one hand, I heard you talking about that how leading a team with kindness and laying off people with empathy was one of the defining moments of your life. At the same time, at the age of five, you said you knew that you were different. So as I'm just listening to you, a few questions are emerging for me and I'm going to present it to you and I'm going to leave it to you. Which one would you like to play with? One, what were those early signs at the age of five or six that you could pick up that gave you a clue that you could possibly be a gay man as you grow up in your life? That's one. Mm -hmm. Second is with that identity, which I'm sure at one point in time was not easily acceptable to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people might look at you from a different perspective. Right. How did you deal with that? So knowing you're different, right? At the age of five, you don't, you don't understand identity or gender or, or yeah. anything to do with sexuality. Orientation, yeah. Right, you, none of that. But I just knew I was different from the from my cousins, from my mm. brother, from the neighbors. I didn't want to play sports. I didn't want to basketball. I was m much more of a gentle soul. I wasn't the, the typical, uh, you know, out in the street fighting or, or, or playing sports. So I, I identified as very different. Then as you grow older, you realize, oh, I know I'm different and you just know. I don't know how to explain it. You just know. And um, obviously growing up in the 70s and 80s, that was not something socially acceptable. You didn't, yeah. you didn't talk about it. Now, I knew in my, within my family, it wouldn't have been a problem. But society does, didn't accept that. Where, does society, where did a society accept such a thing? Here in Manhattan. So you know you can come to a big city. It's cosmopolitan. Everyone lives Mm -hmm. from around the world in Manhattan. And I knew that that's where I was going to find my life. I knew mm -hmm. I was going to be able to, I know people don't like this, this term, but I knew I could find my tribe, my community. And I was lucky. I found a beautiful career and I have a very long relationship with the, with the same guy for 35 years. And it's wonderful. Wow. Wow. Bless you both. Thank you. You know, the, naive individual that I was. I didn't have this definition of that there's something called being a gay man. I remember my first jobs where I encountered someone who was hitting on to me. That was my first or the second day in my new job. And this guy would come and would touch me at all the inappropriate places. And I could not understand that because I didn't have this understanding of what he was doing or the way he was uh, enacting with me or the way he was uh, giving me those pickup lines. And I would say, oh, so sorry, excuse me, so sorry, excuse me. And then he would do it again and do it again. And then I was talking to another friend of mine, his name is Akshay, who happens to be in Dubai these days. I was talking to him, I said, hey, no, every time I'm in the company of so-and-so person, I feel something is missing. I mean, he touches me at the wrong places. I don't know whether it's by mistake or intentionally he's doing it. And then he told me about the entire concept. And I felt really angry. And next day when I was in the office and the moment he tried doing that, I was just waiting for an opportunity when he would do something like that and I would hit him back. I went to him straight, looked into eyes. I said, that was the last time you touched me that way stay away and mm. I experienced a sense of being dirty mm. right and I had this disgusting feeling mm -hmm. and I was looking down at him that was my first encounter but I'm sure even you would have experienced situations oh. like that absolutely how, how, how was it to be in that moment so yeah, no, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm just thinking about 
the tolerance I grew up with, right? So identity and orientation, all of that. I grew up Catholic family. We were one Catholic family in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And my mother's side of the family was Italian. My father's side of the, the family was Irish, right? Descendants. So, so I learned from a young age, not everyone is the same. I grew up with this, um, people are different, people believe different things, people have different religions, people have different ethnic backgrounds. And because of my parents, it was instilled in us, you have to be open-minded and accepting. If you don't understand someone's religion, ask about it. If you don't understand um, someone's traditions for holidays because they come from a different part of the world, ask them about it. So when, when definitely in early years, you, you, you instinctually know where talking about who you are is just something that's taboo. Doesn't exist today, luckily, as much. I'm sure there's circles that it lists. But you just realize, and obviously you're a kid, others pick up that you're different, and you're in a, a moment of, I don't know, I don't want to say bullying because that's too strong, but mm. typical bullying. Um, I guess I was just wired that, okay, I need to just move on from this. Mm. I, I, I'm not, I guess, personally wired to stay in a dark place or, or linger in those bad feelings. But I can tell you, um, people who are, people who are stung by it, mm. I'm able to overcome that. And even my, my husband is Brazilian, right? And he isn't American born. He isn't, he doesn't look like me. And from that lens, not the orientation lens, but through the lens of, watching how people can respond to him not being American. The, mm -hmm. the typical, um, you know, white Christian male that you mm -hmm. would, people have, have long associated with power or being in control, you start to understand or you, you, you process the world, or you see the world through there. And for me personally, I understand what your story is telling you, that the story you shared, is mm -hmm. that people don't know. And how can you share your stories so mm -hmm. there's more understanding and there's more acceptance? Mm -hmm. So I guess I never lingered in a place of having my feelings hurt. And I've certainly had my feelings hurt in many ways and probably more on other things or work-related than anything else. But mm -hmm. um, just coming through that and being understanding, you're, you're a wise guy uh, or a smart man, and you'd, uh, you'd probably have a saying for this, but I think there's such healing that comes from forgiving your enemy, you know, and mm -hmm. I don't have a saying that comes to my mind, but if you show that kind of compassion, now that doesn't mean you invite your enemy or, or somebody that's wronged you into your inner circle, but mm -hmm. if you let go of that, you, um, you you just live a better life. Don't hold yeah. on to that. Yeah. So I, I thank you for sharing that your story because your story is probably common, right? Yeah. Growing up, how you, your what society found acceptable was very mm -hmm. different. Yeah, I mean that was one of the chapters of my life, and would love to share another chapter of my life as we move on. But will help me understand before we get to that. What were the day-to-day -day challenges that you got to experience when you started to share with people your identity? It's funny. I never shared anything. So um, the challenges were such that um, I, I just, I, I don't know how to describe this. I just was. Even within my family, being with Manuel, all of these years. We just were. People just knew Will and Manuel. My nieces and nephews obviously just knew it was Uncle Will and Uncle Manuel. So there was never the typical um, revelation. Coming, coming, coming out of the closet. Never, so, never. Because so, just lived as is. Hmm. Yeah. So no Ricky Martin episode 
happened oh. with you? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would the closest was um, we'd always just lived our life and we were always together. And it was just not something we talked about. It wasn't something you were, it was not anything that you're trying to hide necessarily. It just was like, well, it never came up. When's the right time for it to come up? And really we started to discuss it openly when my nieces and nephews were all growing up. And as they were getting up and there were, there were just moments where it was like, okay, let's just talk about it. And now we talk about it, but it wasn't a reveal, right? Mm. And especially my nieces and nephews grew up in a time, a day and age where like, yeah, this is, it's obvious. Yeah. And so um, when you start to see that society has changed, right? And the youth, younger people have grown up with all sorts of, of um, mm. role models and identities. So, so Will, this is one topic. I'm sure there are people who know a lot about this, but at the same time, there's a part of our society uh, which probably would not have a lot of exposure to that. Right. So what are the myths associated with LGBTI community that it's important for us to unveil? Um, it, it's really interesting that you ask about that because I, I identify myself as part of the human community. Right? No oh, one's. I love you for this. Right? That's why I named my, my company. My, 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 my apologies. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so, but it is very, very interesting. New York City, married long term. Um, the two of you live your life here and abroad, and, and you've done all these amazing things. People identify you with that community. But I've never been part of any sort of scene. My work has been my work. My husband's work has been his work. And we just happen to be um, a couple. Now, what's really interesting, and I'll share this with you, and, and when my husband watches this, he'll probably kill me for sharing this story. But I jokingly, when I left my former career, right, someone said, well, what are you going to do next, Will? And here I am now, all these months later, I'm, I'm speaking to you and I speak to other people. I flippantly said to the person who asked me the question, well, oh, it's obvious. I am going to be the gay Oprah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I thought it was very clever because obviously we spoke about this. I want to speak. I want to share. I, 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 I just, Oprah's a role model for those of us who like to tell stories or be a conduit for other people to tell their stories, right? Yeah. You get it. So my husband was like, why would you say that? Why can't you just be the next Oprah? Why would you, why would you limit yourself? And I, and I was taken aback a bit, but I understood what he meant because the, a label, and this is where labels get dangerous, right? To label anybody a certain thing. Because mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all a mixture of everything that we've gone through. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I don't know if there's an example of, of, of people that just live their life, I would say that would be me along with Manuel, where we just kind of lived and the world caught up to us. I don't know how that happened. We just mm. found, we were two souls who found one another. Our families meshed. Manuel's family has been here, um, family gatherings and, and reunions. And so it's been one big mixture of a Brazilian um, American family, which has been great. Mm. But it just happened organically, if, if that mm. makes any sense whatsoever, without Absolutely. any, without any um, Ricky Martin moment. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so let me just take this opportunity to introduce Will once again. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Will, a communicator conduit guy who happens to be a gay. Exactly. Mm. Right. And, and happens to be bald, right? <laughs> happens to be bald as well. <laughs> so, so will help me understand. Uh, what are the other gifts that you have been blessed with in your life? What I hear you saying is that you have been blessed with a lot of empathy, kindness, treating human beings like human beings. LGBTI community is from where now I'm really looking at is absolutely a wrong way of categorizing people, and that's the reason I think you run this community called the Aspiring Human. So, help me understand. What are the other gifts that you have been blessed with? that you use today to be a source of good in the world? 
I realized uh, another defining moment, or I realized during the pandemic, during the mm-hmm. lockdown, in yeah. this very room, I was representing the largest museum in the co- country. And I was part of a task force with other museums in New York City. And we, the cultural ins- organizations of this city, needed to come together to figure out how do we reopen safely? And how do we take care of our staff and our public? And so it was five months in this very room, call after call and meeting and planning and, and scripting and trying to get all the information we could to reopen New York City. And the museum community was the first community to reopen New York. Mm. And so you do what you do because you love what you do. And I have no problem talking and I love meeting new people. Mm. And I think that started to change me. And so after we reopened and everything was, was set and we're still dealing in many pockets of the world with, with variants and the pandemic is, is not yet over. Mm. The pandemic, if you have to look for, a, for a, maybe it's not right to say bright side, things shifted and myself, I realized my gift was not to have all the answers and not to know everything. My gift is I love the collaboration process, getting people that know bits and pieces. How do you get people together and share and debate and, and from the heart decide what is the right thing to do for the staff first and making sure the staff is safe to safely take care of your visitor, your guest, your customer. Mm. And then you spend a portion of your life dedicated to that. And when things started to ease up in New York, that experience helped me expand as a human, but I felt a calling to mm. use, to go out there, get step out of what was comfortable and familiar and mm. known and people I absolutely loved working with Mm. but something within me said there's a big wide world out there you're going to find your way Mm. and you are going to find the answers go deep within and that's what I've been doing the last six months or so Mm. led me to a call with you here today right I'm talking about all sorts of things and so I'm trying to use my gift of being able to talk I love to do it, to mm. be able to connect. And another C word is curiosity. I am mm. genuinely curious about people, right? If we had ours, I would be asking you about your family and your neighborhood, your favorite foods. And not because I'm trying to write a book about you, but because I love to get to know people and what mm. makes people tick. And that's that's what aspiring better human Again, something came in a dream and a nod to all of the people I hired for years because they were part-time jobs. People come to New York, people come to Manhattan. They're aspiring dancers, singers, actors, lawyers, doctors, curators. And so what's this guy going to do? You're ending one career to go into the unknown. What Mm. should I be? I should be an aspiring better human because we're never done. And if Mm -hmm. I can find other humans, certainly someone like yourself, who are interested in uplifting others and Mm -hmm. being able to speak to things, and that is very different from what, you know, regular media is about, right? Cable media here in the States, I don't know about where you are, is quite negative. The tone is always negative, but Mm -hmm. people are hungry for something positive. People Mm -hmm. want inspiration and people want authenticity. So Mm. my gift is to be able to take every, I've got stories, you've got stories, everyone has stories. How can I use my gift of loving to speak about my experience? Mm. How can I use that to create a platform for other people to tell their stories? 
Mm. And so that's that that's my big goal and dream to be able to do um, that kind of speaking and employing people. And how do you create a community of people who want to do good? And it doesn't have to be on the Oprah scale. Like I use that as a joke, but why not go big if you're gonna mm. <laughs> if you're gonna ask for something? But you 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 can influence your own neighborhood, your own mm. church, your own temple, your own mosque, your own your own circle of friends in school, if mm. you can be a positive influence. And I don't think yeah. that's that's a, a that's um. It doesn't need to be big. It mm. it's big work, and it's a big you thing know, to do. But it doesn't need yeah. to be on scale like so, this. So, will you're talking about creating an impact, it could be your church, your mosque, your temple, your community. And you also use the word authenticity, hand on heart. If you were to talk about that something makes you cry today, the deep wound that you have been holding on to, which might be stopping you to go out in the world and create the impact that you would like to create. What's that one wound that you would like to heal before you go out and be a, mm, that's a, a, light, a really good lighthouse? Um, I think I'm in the process of healing it. And... Um... I've been writing about it a great deal, personally, journaling. Um, I'm a kindness advocate, right? I'm here talking to you about kindness. I want to spread kindness. But I'm reflecting on the things that would make me cry or you feel badly about. There have been plenty of times in my life where I have been unkind. Mm -hmm. And so instead of beating myself up about it, I try to learn from everything. So those moments where we're not the best that we can be, right? We're not as kind as we can be. You share the story about yourself. You can't, you can't let that stop you from evolving, right? Mm. But you can, you can think about what made me be unkind? Mm. What made, what, what was there? What do I need to work on so I don't repeat that unkindness? Mm. And so that, that I think has been um, the, where I've been trying to understand it. Because immediately, if you and I were, had an argument, right? And you want to go back out. You, 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 sometimes, you, you sometimes bring up an argument that happened five years ago. You bring things up. Why do you keep bringing that up? Why do you keep bringing it up? How many times did I tell you, but until you heal that hurt, yeah. it's, just gonna, it's just gonna keep going. And that's what I'm trying to work on. Yeah, no, and I think, I think it, it begins from healing your own self. I can, I can relate to that. Let me share another chapter of my life. A few weeks back, I was in one of the conferences where I came across another gentleman. Now, this guy, when I met him for the first time, I was talking to him and he said, hey, haughty. <laughs> and I could not understand that. I said, what does that That's mean? That's always a compliment, right? Yeah, yeah. So, hey, what does that mean? And normal conversation going on. He said, no, that's not true, Hoti. And once <laughs> and twice, I could not understand that. So anyway, so we started the conversation and he said, tell me more about yourself. And I said, oh, I'm married. I've got a daughter, blah, 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 blah. He said, oh, shucks, I've already lost you, is it? And I could not understand that as well few more pickup lines the conversation continued and during the conversation i said aisa mat bolo bhai bhai is like brother don't say this bhai he said don't call me bhai don't call me brother i said there's something wrong here but anyways now my exposure to this world is very different from the exposure that i had then now, this time when i started speaking to him out of curiosity, I asked, started asking questions and he said that he happens to be a gay man. I said, ah, now I can connect all the dots. And I told him, hey, now I can connect all the dots. Is that what you meant? And he said, yes. I said, shucks, so sorry, my friend. <laughs> and I said, this time, I said, so sorry, my friend. I didn't want to say brother. I did not want to uh, wash off my hands from that conversation because <laughs> this time... I could experience inclusion. Mm -hmm. I could experience love and care with them. And it's I remember when I, absolutely, yes. When I was leaving from that conference, I ensure that I go there. I met him, I hugged him. I said, you take care of yourself 
and he said, okay, hottie. <laughs> okay, so here it is, I think. Good to have journey, a little fun. Yeah, so the journey that I'm talking about is where I was, uh, where I was being unkind to myself. I was being unkind to the other person where I created a wall of separation between me and another human being. Uh, and today when I was talking to him, when he said, hey, hottie, he said, hey, thank you. <laughs> At least you found me interesting, right? <laughs> well, if you were to go back and if you were to give a piece of advice to your younger self, what advice would you offer? Definitely slow down. And um, I was, I'm a recovering perfectionist, I would say. Mm -hmm. Younger years, younger me, I was so driven. I was older 30 years ago than I am today. And my mentality, I, I, I think that I just, I wasn't involved enough. I wasn't, I didn't grow enough. And life knocks you down. You learn different things. You have different disappointments and all of it just shapes you to who you are. What I would tell the younger me was slow it down. Don't take everything so seriously. Every plan you are going to make is probably, no, not probably, will not work out the way that you thought. Yeah. And so often when I look back, everything turned out way better. So mm -hmm. imagine, you start imagining a future for yourself, for other people, for your company, and you understand you have this vision, but work towards it to be even bigger. Because if you can get to a certain point in your life and, and feel and appreciate all of your blessings, imagine if you worked towards it. And I would say younger Will mm. probably did, wasn't um, fully baked, didn't understand or hadn't lived mm. a life of all sorts of good, bad, and everything in between. Yeah. And that's what makes us who we are, right? You learn from everything, everything. You either win or you learn. I believe mm -hmm. that, right? You win or you learn. And the bad stuff is there because it's supposed to teach us something. Is how yeah. I see it. You know, this reminds me of what Rumi said when he spoke about that, how yesterday he wanted to change the world. But today when he's wiser, Love he that. wants to change himself. Yes. You know, I personally believe, and I have said this on, on this platforms on several occasions, that the world is broken. All of us are born in fractured and dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. And here you are talking about kindness, where you have declared yourself as the kindness ambassador. Yep. What are the different ways, Mr. Kindness Ambassador, that we can spread kindness in the world? You just said it. You start with yourself. You're kind to you, you, the people in your home. You're kind to the community. You're kind to the person at the, the bakery that you go to. You're kind to the bank teller. And it costs nothing to be kind, right? Hold back, right? I'm a big LinkedIn fan. And I use LinkedIn and I communicate and I've connected with tons of people like yourself. There's no reason to be unkind. If I post something, if you post something, if someone else posts something and you don't like it, there's no reason to go in there and start fighting with the person. Then don't like it. Don't follow yeah. me. Don't follow you. And so if you can create that model of, hey, it's a big world out there. There's billions of people. And if, if we could just start in our own community, if I could be nice to the neighbors in this building, if I could be nice to the people I encounter in my neighborhood, if I could be nice and kind to my clients, right? That spreads out, that's contagious. And so while it's a big lofty goal to go out there and change the world and change leadership, how do we not know that there are young people, old people, any age people out there who believe in kindness that could grab the microphone can run for maybe a political office, could mm -hmm. run a company, and le having that example in the business world, in the, in the political world, I mean, I mean that's, that's talking about really big goals, but it can happen. 
Kindness is what the world needs most. You said it, we're fractured. And we've moved away from um, just ba- th- treating each other with basic dignity and humanity. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, as I often share, that kindness and compassion will never go out of fashion. As you said it, mm-hmm. being human will never go out of fashion. You could be an engineer, you could be a lawyer. I remember my conversation with my niece when she was going for her MBBS. And I told her that, you know, you are anyways intelligent. You will become a doctor anyways. That's not a question. 100 people in your batch would become doctors. Thousands of people would become doctors on a every year basis. That's not a question. The question is, are you a good human being who happens mm-hmm. to be a doctor? Right. right. And that's the question that I left her with. And today, every time when she calls me up, she tells me about how she's been able to bring in more humanity in every conversation with her patients. I feel so happy. I feel so happy. Well, That's thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank for you. Sp- spreading the word of love and compassion in the world. I think I can tell you with utmost conviction that world is a better place because of people like you. And back to you, my friend. Absolutely. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to talk about it and share my story. Thank you so much, Will. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.